the presentation has been inspired by the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, 70 years since her accession on February 6th, 1952. And this presentation is an exploration of some of Granton and Strathspey's connections with royalty over not, not just 70 years, but over 2,000 years. But we're going to start with a wee fairy story, if I might. It's not one of the legends of Dava Moor. It uh, takes place in a far, far away land long ago. And there was a relatively young girl and she climbed a tree. And it so happened it was a giant fig tree. And from its highest branches in the morning, she was watching the sunrise and an eagle flew across. And at that very moment, she turned into a queen. And that girl was Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. And now, 70 years later, that queen is still with us, touching all our lives. A remarkable and true story which we shall celebrate, even more so if I turn the page, by looking at this and many other royal connections. Grantown itself grew out of a royal charter. Old Grantown, close to Castle Grant, was in 1694, raised to the status of a borough of regality by William III and Mary II, who ordained that the castle town of Fruhi, now and for all time to come, be called the town and borough of Grant, and be the principal borough of regality. The regality cross in Grantown Square today symbolises that charter. And whilst Granton and Strathspey have not been flooded with royal visitors, they nevertheless have many associations with kings and queens and emperors around the world. Indeed, such was the importance of the Grants in the late 17th century that uh, Ludwig Grant of Fruki and Grant was known as the Highland King. He was a member of Parliament and apparently took a very active part in his proceedings. And on one occasion, he insisted that his dissatisfaction with an act of Parliament be noted for the record. Duke of York, the Crown's representative in Parliament, reportedly remarked sarcastically, let his Highland Majesty's protest be marked. And from that time forward, Laird Ludwig was frequently referred to as the Highland King. So, back in the mists of time, who knows what ancient minor kings supervised the setting up of the standing stones at Ballantown, or looked down from the hill fort of Tomacast on Benmore, what great Pictish leaders joined with Colgacus to challenge the Roman legions at, Mont at Mons Graupius. We know that in the middle of the 6th century, St. Columba, whose well is in Glenbeg, visited Inverness and Brood, king of the northern Picts of Fort Drew. Did Brood likewise travel to Strathspey in his attempts to unify Pickland? In the 11th century, did Macbethida rule the province of Murray and King of Scotland, Shakespeare's Macbeth, did he travel through this country, whether visiting witches, as Shakespeare would have it, or defending his realm against both English and Scots? Just as today, Grantown lies at the junction of several roads leading to all parts of the country, so in medieval times, what became known as Strath Bay must have held a key position. Old maps show both a Roman road to Forest, the Itervaris, and the Via Regia, or King's Road. And whilst the province of the Roman road, the provenance of the Roman road is questionable, King Alexander II did apparently lead an army to halt Norse raids from the Earl of Orkney. History, or at least legend, does associate the Via Regia or Regia with Alexander. Did he in fact lead troops at some point through Strathspey? Around 1236, according to Marshall Smith in his book Strathspey Highways and Byways, the road was said to have followed the route of the modern A9 through Dermocter along the right-hand bank of the Spey and across the river at Pollowick. 
And there's an, another royal connection here. The wooded country called the Forest of Leonich and Bray Murray was seen by Alexander as suitable for royal hunting. In 1236, he exchanged with Andrew, Bishop of Murray, the lands of Finlarg, near the church of Inverallan, for this forest. There are, however, more well-documented well royal connections. Garton Roth, sometimes known as Tom Pitlack, was an important fortified site on the banks of the Spey near today's boat of Garton. Part has been washed away by the river and part cut through by the railway. And though the wooden building and much of its wooden palisade have gone, still its defences are clearly visible. And from the top, its tr strategic site is plain with commanding views across and along the Spey in both directions. Here, between September 28th and October 2nd, 1303, stayed Edward I of England, Edward Longshanks, Hammer of the Scots. Murray was the northern turning point of his Scottish campaign. He'd spent a few days hunting in the Garton Hills, yet still found time to seal several documents produced by his Chancery clerks and headed Garton at Roth. These can still be seen in the National Archive. His journey south to England was via Kildrummy in Aberdeenshire. He certainly had plans to return north, but he never did so. Local sources are unclear about details of this period in Scottish history. What is clear, however, is that the iconic and isolated highland location of Loch Endor is especially famous because of its royal connections. It would appear that Edward I also stayed in Loch Endor. Andrew of Ointown tells, and o'er the mounts then also fast, till Loch Endor where came Strachty past, there sojourned quite a while he bad, till he the north all wanted had. In 1896, Inverness Scientific and Field Club paper says he arrived at Loch Endor Castle on 25th of September 1303. Paper continues, having captured the castle, the king and court devoted some time to feasting and hunting. In anticipation of the latter, he brought with him from England several packs of deer and wolfhounds. What else would you take when you're travelling? <laughs> Paper continues that having captured the castle, the king and court devoted time to hunting, returning in the evening to find awaiting them the battlements lit up by fir torches on every side reflecting their gloomy shadows on the dark surface of the loch. The night was spent in sumptuous feasting. Edward Longshanks was not the only royal visitor to, Cast to Loch Endor Castle. Not many years later, Edward III also visited Loch Endor. King Edward III of England left Blair Athol on the 12th of June, 1336 and arrived with 500 horsemen at Loch Endor on the 15th of June. His mission was to rescue the imprisoned Lady Christian Bruce, sister of Robert Bruce. The Loch Endor saga continues several year late, years later with the castle's most infamous occupant. In the 1370s, the castle, land and lordship of Badenoch was gifted to Alexander Stuart, fourth son of Robert II of Scotland better known as the Wolf of Bainach. Despite his many deeds of terror, which included sacking Elgin and burning down its cathedral, he was buried in Dunkeld Cathedral with the epitaph Bonae Memore of good memory. Possibly the best known royal figure associated with the Highlands is Charles Edward Stuart. And whilst the Jacobites briefly took Castle Grant and were prominent in Badenoch, having travelled over the Coryarik from the west and then over Dromochter, there's little to suggest that Bonnie Prince Charlie had occasion to visit Strathspey. And closer to home, in the property on the north side of the square, lot number eight, now Lethendry Lodge, lived William Lyon and his family. William was a plasterer reputedly the best in the north. He'd worked in Duff House and Castle Grant, 
This was a time of famines in the north, and there was a shortage of work. William followed up an advert in the Edinburgh Press, submitted by Charles Cameron, the Scottish architect, then working in St. Petersburg on the great palace of Tsarkoye Selo for Catherine the Great. By 1783-84, William and at least one of his sons were settled in Russia. William was joined by his daughter, Jean Lyon, who, known as Jenny Lyon, became a big fat favourite in the royal household. She was appointed by the Empress as nursemaid to the future Tsar Nicholas I and stayed with him constantly during the first seven years of his life. They say that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And from Lyon, the young Grand Duke learned even such things as the Russian alphabet, his first Russian prayers, and it said he also talked with a Scottish accent. He also learned his hatred of the Poles. At least he liked to trace the origin of his bitter antipathy towards that people to the stories told by his nurse about her painful experience in Warsaw in the turbulent year 1794. Now in Elgin, in 1820, there was considerable unrest during the parliamentary elections of that year following the death of George III, and it was focused on Grant Lodge, built for Sir James Grant the plans of Robert Adam, 1760s, and the most northerly villain villa designed by Adam. People of Elgin had always been supportive of the Grants in any election, but this time things were different. At an earlier visit by Prince Leopold, who later became King of Belgium, Colonel Grant invited the Elgin Provost and the Town Council to dine with the Prince at Grant Lodge. By something of an oversight, the official deacons of trade were, not, were omitted from the invitation. They refused an apology and a generous alternative offer, and instead ordered a cask of whiskey and got uproariously drunk. This started a rift with the family of Grant. Feelings are high during the election. So James Grant's son, the invalid Earl, and his three sisters, the ladies Anne, Peniel, and Margaret, lived in Grant Lodge. Many blamed Lady Anne, and in the streets they were followed, shouted at, and menaced to such a degree that they went about in fear of their lives. Eventually, they were beleaguered in Grant Lodge and caused the great bar to be placed across the door, whilst an angry mob outside howled. Lady Anne, though, was a woman of character, and she resented the treatment by the mob, and was indignant at the discourtesy shown to herself and her sisters. Late on Saturday 11th of March, under cover of darkness, she dispatched a messenger to Strathspey, requesting that a body of Highlanders be sent to guard Grant Lodge, or to act as they might be required. The news was received in Strathspey and circulated on Sunday morning, as many of the clansmen were at worship in church or in the open field on the, on the open in the field of Strathbeg at Nethy. The fiery cross was sent round and some 600 clansmen marched on Elgin to protect their much beloved Lady Anne. Thanks to the entirely peaceful presence of the Highlanders, the siege was relieved, calm restored, and the election carried out. It's a remarkable story, and one told recently to members. It was a further royal connection as a tailpiece. In the summer of 1822, during one of King George IV's colourful public occasions, in the course of his only public visit to Scotland, he asked one of his lords in waiting to point out the lady on whose account so many Highlanders had marched to Elgin two years previously. Lady Anne being pointed out, the king declared, Well, truly she is an object fit to raise the chivalry of the clan. Now, September 1860 and Queen Victoria and Albert visited and stayed in the Grand Arms. It was the first night the Queen had ever stayed in a public inn. 
the party were incognito. But this didn't last, for as she wrote in her journal, the murder was out, for all the people were in the street, and the landlady waved her pocket handkerchief, and the ringleted maid, who had curled papers in the morning, waved a flag from the window. She continues, her coachman evidently did not guess or observe anything. Of all Grantown's royal connections, this, Queen Victoria's visit, was the most important and influential. In 1868 was published Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands from 1848 to 1861, and was picked up by press, especially the Elgin Current, putting Grantown firmly on the map. Following as it did, shortly after the arrival of not one, but two railway companies, it kick-started the development of tourism, promotion of summer letting, and the outward expansion of the town, for example, Woodside Avenue. As new buildings were erected and old ones developed, this marked the divide between Georgian Grantown and Victorian Grantown. It marked the start of unprecedented growth of the town and its economy. Tom and Towle, on the other hand, it was revealed, did not impress Her Majesty as she declared it as the most tumble-down, poor-looking place I ever saw. A long street with three inns, miserable, dirty-looking houses and people, and a sad look of wretchedness about it. A permanent reminder of Queen Victoria's long reign is the, Jubi the Golden Jubilee Cairn of 1887 on the Cromdales. The local paper reported, Last Monday afternoon, a few farmers and their friends assembled on Craganaclash, the highest peak of the, Cairn, the Cromdale Hills, and erected a cairn of stones to commemorate Her Majesty's Jubilee. The pile is 16 foot high and 28 feet in diameter. The stone bearing the inscription was dressed and lettered by Mr. William Gillis of Harn. Ten years later, part of the Diamond Jubilee celebrations involved a fete held around the clubhouse, for which a royal standard and some smaller flags were bought. The tea room got in extra drinks, three gross ginger beer, three gross lemonade, etc., and these drinks were sold at threepence per glass. Tea was tuppence, cakes a penny, and plain biscuits, a quarter farthing each. <laughs> Two Grantown buildings carry the Royal Victoria collection further, both for entirely different reasons. The scheme to create what is the present community centre commenced in 1893. After many appeals for public support, the fund was well short of what was required. It was thus decided to broaden the appeal and make it a permanent memorial of Diamond Jubilee Year. The Queen gave it her most cordial approval, and the foundation stone was laid in 1897 by the Countess of Seafield. Still, funds were inadequate, so the largest bazaar Grand Town has ever known was launched, with success over three days. The building was opened in 1898 with the title of Victoria Institute a name which survives in the minds of many older Grantonians to this day. The second building is what is now the Garth Hotel, merely because it was the residence of one flamboyant Victorian, Mary Mackay. Who was Mary Mackay? Well, that was the real name of the author, Mary Corelli, who stayed here for one summer. During that time, however, she made a marked impression, not least on a young Robert Bruce Locker, who later wrote, when she drove down the high street with her large picture hat, her ponies and her Pomeranians, she made Granton take her seriously. Perhaps that's why, he says, she gave me the mistaken impression that authors were not only rich, but very important people. She was, indeed, Queen Victoria's favourite writer and the only novelist invited to the coronation of Edward VII in 1902. She also wrote, incidentally, I've never married because there was no need. I have three pets at home, 
which answer the same purpose as a husband. I have a dog which growls every morning, a parrot which swears all afternoon, and a cat that comes home late every night. Uh, a rather more dignified link with Queen Victoria was Sir Patrick Grant of Arthur Blair, gold stick in waiting to Queen Victoria, Governor of the Royal Hospital Chelsea, Commander of the Army in India. And as a young man, he played a leading role in the Grand Raid in Elgin. He also carries, for us, connection right through to the society today, as he was the grandfather of Dr. I.F. Grant, one of Scotland's foremost historians, and for many years, our highly distinguished honorary president. Heading downstream before crossing the spay at Advey, you pass Tulkin Lodge, or at least you would have done Old Tulkin Lodge, the Highland residence of Arthur D. Sassoon, Esquire, and which was honoured by visits from their Royal Highness, Prince of Wales, and the Duke of York. Kaiser Wilhelm was also one of the many friends invited to Tulkin at some point between 1901 and 1910. It may be interesting to note the reply of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to an address presented him by the inhabitants of Grantown on the occasion of his passing through the borough. HRH said, I have much enjoyed my visit to this beautiful part of the Highlands. It gives me great pleasure on my way to Edinburgh to welcome the Emperor and Empress of Russia to pass through Grantown and receive your address. I shall not fail to convey to the Queen the loyal expression of devotion to Her Majesty and the Royal Family and on the part of the Highlanders of Strass Bay. And I thank you also for your kind words about the Princess of Wales, who will, I know, greatly appreciate them. As well as the hearty welcome you've given me, I trust I may at some future time have another opportunity of visiting this charming district. Sir Robert Bruce Lockhart, who was head of the British mission in Russia in World War I, wrote that the Cairns on the Cromdale Hills, I helped to build for Edward VII's coronation, that was August 1902, and the coronation bonfire was lit by Ina, my uncle's elder daughter, then a child of ten. And here we have uh, recognition of Edward VII and Mr. Sassoon on Dava Moor and the Dowager Countess, and then we have a group at Tulkham, Grantown's first party house. Edward VII used to come to stay with the Sassoons in Tulkham Lodge. Edward used to drive into Grantown in an open carriage. He always used to order a suit of Highland tweeds from A.C. Colley, the local outfitter who took a pride in pointing out to his clients the material chosen by the king. Later in the century, George VI's brother, the Duke of Gloucester, was another royal visitor to Grantown. And here you see one of A.C. Grant's many adverts under royal and distinguished patronage. To celebrate the coronation of George V on June 22, 1911, the Grand Town Council planted a row of trees alongside the barn flowing beside the skating pond. The extensive celebrations in Grand Town and all the Strathspey communities were fully reported in the Strathspey Herald of June 29th that year. For the Grand Town school children, there were sports and a picnic on the ladies' golf course and each was presented with a coronation sixpence. In the evening, there was to be a bonfire and fireworks in the Black Park. Unfortunately, the fireworks had not been delivered. And the bonfire was so constructed that it collapsed very soon after it was lit. And the press, the week after, made several comments, not entirely flattering on this. 
Also to mark the occasion, the town council was presented with a handsome and elegant chain of office. It suggested that it was the presence of the Prince of Wales, the future George V in the area, which brought Emily Pankhurst to Grand Town to talk in the public hall at the end of August 1809. Now, this undated photograph may well be one of June 1911, and that procession that we talked about shows the promised, if that's the case, it shows promised Barclay, the Baileys, Grant, and Emory, councillors J.S. Grant, Beale, and Remington. And we suspect that it could be that because it does have, it does have evidence of flag hanging out. It does show the Provost and Baileys in what were then their new robes, and it doesn't show the chain of office which was presented later on that day, and it does appear to be the right time in history. So believe it might well have been outside the outside the institute and uh, Bertie Billiards. During the years of the Second World War, the hills and lodges around Loch Morley were training ground for Norwegian troops, intent on playing their part in ridding their country of Nazi invaders. Strathspey's royal connection continued with the visit of the King of Norway. Whilst training in Strathspey, the company, the Norwegian company Linje, were visited by their Norwegian king, Hakon VII. The men of the company were popular on their visits to Grantown. It was ultimately their task to destroy the German-controlled heavy water plant in Norway, a raid which became the subject of the 1965 film The Heroes of Telemark. Now the courthouse, for many years Grantown's main civic building, has seen many royal proclamations. Courthouse dates to 1868, although the town flag and the Regality Cross are much newer, though both with centuries-old links and inevitably royal connections. And just one example, the coronation of Elizabeth II, which took place 2nd of June 1953 at Westminster Abbey in London. And that month, at Grand Town's Courthouse, members of the Town Council swore their allegiance some may be able to recall the coronation celebrations in the town that year. In the Grand Arms Hotel, in the centre of the square, in a building dating back to the very first days of the new town, has welcomed thousands of visitors. And here was the first public inn in which Queen Victoria had ever stayed, and a hundred years later visited by another royal monarch. Monday, 14th of August, 1961, on our way back to Balmoral after a tour of the coastal villages of Murray, Queen Elizabeth visited Grand Town and was very warmly welcomed. Many will be able to recall that day and have their own personal memories. The Queen visited the Grand Arms and was told, and here's the room in which stayed your great-grandmother. And fortunately, and unbeknown to the then manager and the Queen, that part of the building had been demolished during the rebuilding of 1873-74. Don't spoil a good story for historical accuracy. In the years that followed, there have been further visits from members of the royal family. On one occasion to visit Home Hill and another to formally open the Grand Town Museum. The Queen's Silver Jubilee it was a special edition of the primary school newspaper, May 1977. It carried a quiz and a colouring competition, all carefully reproduced by a banda, someone's early ventures into IT. It read Jubilations. On Friday 20th of May to celebrate the Silver Jubilee, pupils of primary one, two and three are having a party with entertainment provided by primary seven. Later, the older pupils are staging a Jubilee Novelty Highland Games. To commemorate the occasion, a tree is to be planted in the square. 
celebrations continue with a holiday. It's also recorded several lovely quotes from the children, including The Queen has lots of jewellery, an orb and a crown for special days. The Queen has four children and jewels. She rides in a coach. The Queen has a crown and she wears it to dinner dances. Food is obviously important. The Queen and her husband have nice cakes in their palace. And wishfully, one boy said, I wish I could be a king and I would make everyone fat by eating them, making them eat too much. And indeed, some of the class from whence those comments came. It's a primary one, or some of them. Not a very good photo, but it's the only one that we have, as far as I know. And the aforementioned tree. Forty-five years later, and it's now the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, the maple planted in the square for the Silver Jubilee may have died, but our community council are planting, when the weather gets better, a collection of native trees as part of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Green Canopy. And so, with thanks for the photographs, Sir Graham and John, and some from Society and Museum Collections, as well as many from online sources, Textual help from, of course, George Dixon and Society Records. Technical help, as you will have observed this evening, from Mr. Colner, much appreciated. And from Jess, who was off duty tonight, but came in specially to help us as well. Thanks also to the Grant Arms, management and staff, society members, and especially the trustees. And to those of you who braved the weather and the pandemic and everything else to come along tonight, thank you all very much. I'd just like to thank Bill too for the marvellous presentation. He always comes up with original material, don't know how he does it, but uh, it was really interesting and uh, we know more than we came in with, as usual. Thanks let's, to you, Bill, and your efforts. Let's not believe it all. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of it is uh, the best I could get. So thank, thank you, Graham, for that. I think probably there we go back out into the blizzard or whatever, but I don't know if anyone's got any comments, perhaps memories of, <laughs> well, the Jubilees. Um, I certainly remember the Queen's coronation games and so on, but not in Grand Town. <coughs> I remember that special tin we got. I'm sure we got sixpence as well in the games. And I'm sure Grand Town must have done the same on the Queen's visit. One of the reasons I didn't go into depth because I thought, well, we will have memories and maybe somebody could share. I don't know whether that's quite the case this evening. Well, I, I, was, I was there when she appeared and we were all taken up to the square, you know, to see her. You know, we were just a bit uh, awestruck, really, you know. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, I can remember it just one or two images quite clearly, you know. And this, of course, the town council were there in force and, and uh, everything, you know. So, uh, uh, not much more about the day and what happened in the school and so on, you know, but we'd been well primed for it anyway and we were all marched up until being our best behaviour. Which of course you all were. <laughs> those, those were the days. But when, you, when you saw that photograph of the, the march outside the, the Legion of the Institute, how, how smart the scholars at the back of the, the group were. Right with the promise of lemonade and biscuits. Bill, you talk about the, the, the Highland King, of, you know, he was a member of Parliament, uh, 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 Grantham, going down to London, obviously. 
How did they travel around in those times? I presume, as far as as far as he was concerned, it must have been just on horseback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What journey? The, the roads until the <clears throat> mid 18th century were not of uh, anything at all, apart from hill tracks. Yeah. So presumably it, it was. So I'm always very impressed you when know, we go up to look at Scallon, and they were in the 1700s, and um, the priests were travelling between Scallon and Rome and Patmos, and, yes. and these places, you know, they, they, we all just climb in a car now, or, or, or play, but I mean, in those days, these journeys that they made from London to Grantham must have been quite, uh, quite something. It's a solitary lesson. I mean, Queen Victoria and her visit. I mean, she came. She came by a coach of some sort or another. But uh, she was quite happy to get out and walk. Indeed, at Brigham Road, she had to get out and walk because everyone had to, had to because was, they struggled to struggled to get up the hill. And she also climbed. Um, I think it was Ben Dewey at one point. I think it may have been a, a donkey or something to help. But um, <laughs> she was she was game for all these travels. We all did travel. Enormous distances. Mm -hmm. Not uh, not everyone, of course, but I mean there was there was our, our plaster yeah. up sticks and uh, off to St Petersburg, yeah, exactly. you know, just yeah. just like that, yeah. and his daughter to follow, yeah. and uh, a marked impression. Yeah, it's hard to believe it. A lot of the journeys to London went by boat. Could have, could have, once they got to the coast, yeah. could well have been yes, because. Sea charm was indeed yes, the yeah. easiest way. Yeah. Yeah. And all these poor armies who have tramped up and down, mm. and trampled across Strath's Bay backwards mm. and forwards, and there were many of them. Yeah. Yeah. And roads, well, we, we talk of the iter virus and so on, yeah. but I'm not sure that we can picture much of a, much of a road. I think more a, more a track by use and want. Yeah. And if you march enough troops over it, it'll certainly show something. Well, there's no word of the children at the 25th doing what we used to do when we had parties to Grandel, Duke of York, and things like that. It's another real connection. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> Which Duke of York was that? It was back a bit. Oh, a long way back. Yes. Then, like this. About 10,000 men. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think there are probably many more royal connections with, with people who travelled from here all, all around the world and obviously met in with royalty of one kind or another. I mean, the many, the many, many who served in India must have, must have met up with various uh, Maharajas and so on. So, yeah, it's uh, not such an insulated, isolated community as one might imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that there's Loch and Dorm, an sort of iconic Scottish castle, was famous because it hosted so many kings from the south of England. Mm. There you go. Mm. That's mm. that's us. Mm. I'm not sure that Lockendorf is technically in Strathbay, but we're happy to adopt it. Mm. Mm. We've got, we got no, no bounds. Next month, again, funnily enough, on the 18th, because that's how it works, we're back here again for a rather special event in in light of all the many, many walks and tours and trails that we've got around here and the growing interest in them and the huge number, of, increased number of people who have been walking and so on through the woods and on the, on the trails, we decided that we would have a, a forum whereby we'd get as many of these people together as we could so that we could share what everyone's doing and find out what's, what we're doing and that gives us the strength to campaign for better links on the Speyside Way and better links from here to Boat and Methy and so on. And it's coming. And we, this would just give a bit of a, an impetus to it. At the same time, we've got two routes which are being worked on, both influenced and funded by Sustrans. One is the Dublin to Grand Town. NMU, non-motorised user route, off-road, 
and the other is the Grand Town 3A's active travel route which is coming basically through town making it easier and safer for people to get from one destination to another, particularly for getting to school. Both of those sets of consultants will be here doing what they're paid to do, consult. So the more people who come along and offer their opinions and look at the, the various options, you know, would it be on the right of the road or the left of the road or the middle of the road, will it be sectioned off, will we do away with parking in the high street? <laughs> All of which have been suggested. So that's that's on March the 18th, on the Friday. And we're running that through the afternoon and into the evening. In the afternoon it would be like a, almost like a marketplace. And we've got the, the Murray Way and the Dava Way and hopefully someone from the Speyside Way. We've got various groups who take walks and tours and so on who will be here able to present the sorts of things they do which will need better partnership, better sharing and so on. And then in the evening half past seven is our usual time, we'll have one or two more formal, slightly more formal presentations and open discussion as to where we might go and what, what might happen. So it's something of a, like many of our things, an experiment, but um, it's got a lot of interest so far. So thank you all very much indeed. And once again, thanks to Dave for rescuing me because it's a wee bit tricky to talk to slides that you can't see. Mm -hmm. You don't want to hear me, but the picture's always interesting. So, thank you all very much indeed. And uh, back to the, the log fires and the hot drums and whatever. Okay. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Me. And all being well, at some point we'll release this. I'm not quite sure whether it's going to go to the court, but it might be go. We have. We have a YouTube channel now. So if you go online you'll, to the website, you'll get a link to the, uh, to the YouTube channel. And on that, there's a whole collection now of videos, clips, talks, and so on. And we're gradually, gradually, I wish we'd done this for the last 50 years because the amount of information that's gone through here <laughs> is, uh, is amazing. Thank you. Thank you all.